Hello, developers and architects. Are you currently building applications and you want to get bi-directional communication from your front end to your back end? You want your back end to be able to push responses back to your front end, especially if you're using patterns like storage first APIs or you're building asynchronous applications where the work that's being done might not be happening the second a request is submitted to your backend. And that's where Signal R becomes incredibly useful. Signal R is a feature of .NET that allows you to build this bi-directional communication into your .NET applications. And in this video today, you're going to learn how you can deploy Signal R applications onto AWS using completely serverless technologies. And you're going to do that in under 10 minutes to make sure you have a scalable, resilient, and performant way to deploy your SignalR applications. Let's get into it. Quick side note before we get into that, I have just launched a getting started with software architecture course on the Dome Train platform run by the brilliant Nick Chapsis. This covers the fundamentals of software architecture. Agnostic of cloud or technology stack, it provides everything you need to know to get started in the world of software architecture, from gathering business requirements right down to application-specific design patterns. So I've recently finished a course by the wonderful Kevin Griffin on Udemy about SignalR, and it really got me thinking about just how powerful that could be for building asynchronous applications, because it really easily allows you to facilitate that bi-directional communication from your front ends to your back ends. So I thought, how can we do that in a serverless way? And this is what I've ended up with. Let's start with the end in mind. This is a really simple Blazor web application that allows you to translate text from English to any other language that you want. If I pop in my connection URL for my deployed application in AWS, I'm going to connect as James, and then I'm going to translate, hello, my name is James, and Signal R is amazing, and I want to translate that to Italian, do my Duolingo some real favours. And this is going to send that request to the back end over that WebSockets connection. That's going to come back without me doing anything, and you can see that I've got the exact response there. Ciao, mi accomo James, e Signal R è fantastico. <laughs> Go Duolingo. And then as well, the power of SignalR is that if I open up a second browser window now and I connect to that exact same endpoint and I also connect as James, hit the connect button, and then I'm going to say this message is this message is from another browser window. Again, we'll turn that to Italian, hit translate. That's come back in here. And if I flip back to my other tab, you see I've also got the message there. I'm not going to bore you with the Italian pronunciation of that one because, frankly, I'm going to murder it. And this is the power of SignalR because this is actually all happening asynchronously in the back end. And let's have a look what's actually going on here. So there's actually two separate components to the back end of this application. You've got the actual Signal R API. And this is a really simple .NET application. We add Signal R, we add some AWS SDKs, we map the translation hub up onto an actual endpoint, and then we set up some little health checks that will become relevant as to why they're there in just a moment. And this setup Signal R method is actually something that is shared between my two components. So setting up Signal R actually configures a connection to Redis. It uses Redis as the backplane for this application, and that allows multiple instances of the application to share that same state. So regardless of which instance of the application your request hits, it will still be able to distribute that request to all the connected clients. So this is how we add SignalR and you see you are adding Stack Exchange Redis there and you're using the translation prefix for the channel in Redis. Nice and simple, right? So that's the SignalR API. And then we've got this translation worker service. And this is a backend service that's just going to be running over and over again. And it's going to be polling an SQS queue. You see, we're running a receive message request. And you see, this is going to receive messages from an SQS queue. It's going to run the translation of them requests using Amazon Translate. And then it's actually going to publish the message back to the connected clients through SignalR. 
and it uses this send core async. We use the username that was passed in the request. You see, if you remember, I've logged in as James. Then it receives the response and sends that translated response back to all the connected clients who are connected as James. Simple, right? And then, of course, you've got the actual signal R functionality. It's so you've got this translation hub class that inherits from a hub. I'm not going to go into a deep dive of signal R itself in this video. Just know that inheriting from a hub is something you need to do for signal R to work. You've got this on connected method that you can override that actually then sets up a certain connection ID mapping to a to a group, a group in this case being the username. And then you've got this translate message method. This is the one that's actually performing the translation logic. But actually, this signal or request is simply receiving the data in that needs to be translated and just storing that instantly into an SQS queue. This is using a storage first API pattern. So the request comes in, we store that durably, and we can go on and start doing other work. So that's just popped in a queue. Now the message is sat there waiting. You'll notice that is the same queue coming from our configuration as what is being used in the translation queue worker. We've got this translation queue URL configuration option. So when the translation request comes in, in a queue waiting to be processed, once the message has been processed by our queue worker, you see that the translation hub method is called to send that message back to the users. So that's how the signal R part of this works. If you just have a quick look at the front end, just for interest sake, in our index page, when an actual connect happens, we create a hub connection builder and we build this hub connection and we set up if the connection gets closed, we just retry a few times to try and reconnect. And then we actually start up the connection. And then the other bit of configuration that you do is you use this connection.on method. And this is you're saying on something happening on your connection. In this case, if a message comes over the connection that is a received translation response, then we want to take that received string and add that to a list of responses. And it's then responses that are then displayed on the actual UI. When the message is actually sent, the translate method is called, that just invokes a method over the signal or connection. It invokes the translate message method and passes in all of the arguments. You'll notice that the method name string here is the same name of the method that's on our translation hub in our backend. So that's how everything stitches together. Now I told you we're gonna deploy this in a completely serverless way and we're gonna do that using ECS, the Amazon Elastic Container Service and AWS Fargate to give you serverless compute. Now a quick disclaimer, we are using Elasticash for Redis here, not a strictly serverless server. It does remove some of that operational overhead from running Redis. So that's how Redis is running here inside a network. That's already been deployed. If you're following this along through the GitHub repo, there's some Terraform code that will deploy that for you. So how can we deploy this in a serverless way really, really easily? Well, let's come over to a terminal window now. And we're actually going to use the Copilot CLI, not GitHub Copilot, AWS Copilot. By far the best CLI I have ever used. And I don't say that lightly because I've used some good CLIs in my time, but Copilot is incredible because what Copilot allows you to do is simply run the Copilot init command. You can do this in any repository as long as you've got an application in there and you've got a Docker file. And it will ask you what kind of application you want to deploy. Well, we're deploying a load balanced web service here. We want our web application. We can give that service a name. Let's call this test. And then this will actually go off and configure the service. And it's the first thing it's going to do is ask me where my Docker file is. I can enter a custom path to my Docker file, set that route up, and this will now be configured and ready to go. Now, of course, full Blue Peter style for anyone watching in the UK. If you don't, sorry, if you don't get that Blue Peter reference. I've actually gone to the trouble of pre-configuring some of... I've actually gone to the trouble of pre-configuring some of this core pilot configuration. So let's open up VS Code now and we can have a look at what core pilot actually configures. So after I've run that core pilot init command, I've initialized both a load balanced web service for my front end and for my actual signal or back end. And then I've also initialized a worker service to actually do the reading from the queue, translating and pinging the message back to the front end. And once you've done that, 
you end up with this core pilot folder. And under this core pilot folder, where the actual configuration for a particular application is. So let's have a look at our SignalR gateway. This, this is the actual SignalR backend. And there's a lot going on in this YAML, but there's a few things that I will just call out. So you've got the path that the load balancer is going to run on. So if you have with Copilot multiple load balanced applications running within the same service, you can specify different paths and Copilot will configure a single load balancer to route all of them requests. So you'll notice back in our front end, the actual front end and the gateway itself, the signal our gateway are running on the same URL, just with a different path. And you can also configure the health check. So the health check for this application is going to be slash API slash health. You would remember back in the program.cs file, that's what we configured our health checks on. You configure how your application is going to be built. In this case, we path to our Docker file and we're going to use a context directory just so we pull in that shared library as well. And then you can configure the actual environment variables. This is not the best way to do this using environment variables. You can configure Copilot to use SSM parameter store. And I would advise doing that if you're doing this in production copying strings into environment variables is not particularly secure. It's not particularly easy to manage. But for now, this is absolutely fine. And that's how the host name for, this, for the Redis connection and the Q URL for the SQS queue are going to be passed in. So that's our gateway. And you look, if you see our, and if you look at the front end web service, very, very similar configuration. Apart from the fact our path is just the root and we don't need to define a health check because by default, the root will be used as the health check. So that's written on the root. Everything is okay there. And then the worker service that's actually translating things is slightly different, little bit the same, still YAML, still similar options. You'll notice that the type at the top here is a backend service and we don't actually have any port mapping in the image definition because there's no port. This isn't a web application. This is just something in the backend churning away through all these messages on the queue. And that's as simple as Copilot is. The one additional thing that has been added is, is this, the one additional thing that's been added is this add-ons folder. And in this add-ons folder is where you can actually define any custom permissions for your application to assume. In this case, we need SQS permissions to be able to send and receive messages from SQS. This is CloudFormation, nice and easy to add some custom IAM permissions to your applications. Copilot will manage the IAM role, creating all this, setting all that up, everything you need, Copilot's got you back. And then you can come back into your terminal window and just run Copilot deploy. And Copilot will actually ask you, which application do you want to deploy, Mr. Developer? In this case, I'm gonna redeploy our gateway. I'm gonna deploy that to a test environment. Copilot will now look at the configuration compile my Docker image, push that to ECR, do a blue-green deployment of the application in ECS. Copilot is doing all of this for you. It's using Fargate, it's using ECS. Little to no configuration needed for you. What's not to love? That, at the end of all that, you'll get an endpoint spat out the other end. That is what then you can use to build your application. Serverless SignalR, please have a look into it. If you are building SignalR-based applications, this is an incredibly simple way to deploy your application on AWS. And of course, because this is using Fargate and ECS, the operational overhead of your SignalR workload is basically zero. Aside from needing to set the right memory and CPU configuration, you don't have anything else to think about from a SignalR perspective. And of course, you've got a Redis cache sat around. Using Elastic Cache does take away some of that burden, but you do need to keep your eye on your cache, of course. But for many workloads, you might not even need Redis. A single instance of your SignalR backend might be enough. So, so that's serverless SignalR. Bi-directional communication from your front end to your back end. If you're building asynchronous applications that do a lot of work behind the scenes and you want to push a response back to your front end. SignalR is a super, super easy way to do that. As always, if you've liked this video, please like, please subscribe, ding that little notification bell so that you don't miss another video. And of course, I will see you all next time for more serverless AWS fun. Take it easy.